I want to bring you greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right. Okay, am I speaking to myself? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? All right. So let me start over. I want to bring you greetings in the name of Jesus Christ. Uh, before I start, what I'd like to do is uh, I want to say that we've been praying for you, some of us. Uh, me and some of us, uh, we've been praying for you, not just for this conference, not just for the session, but praying for you. And I want you to know that, um, that much prayer is gone. It's because you ask tough questions of life. And when answers are given, I pray that you'll be challenged to actually do it. Your generation, I know, is, you know, least understood, most misunderstood. But I think the Spirit of God, God has a plan for you. The Spirit of God will use you if you're willing to. And that's my, my confidence in the Lord. And that's the reason why I think today is a privilege to come and to minister to you, to serve you. And my prayer today is just this, that what I speak, it won't be of me, but it'll be the message that God will have for you, that God will speak to you, and that I will set aside, I'll step aside. It won't be about me, all right? And so I pray, this is my prayer for you today, that you will hear with an attentive ear and let the Spirit of God speak to you. Be challenged by the King of the universe. He is worth it. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you all to stand up as I read from God's Word. I'm going to read from Ephesians chapter 1 to 14. If I can have you all stand up, that would be great, all right? So let's do that. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 1 to 14. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus. The saints who are in Ephesus. I want you to turn to the person next to you and say uh, to that person, I'm a saint in Jesus Christ. I'm a saint in Jesus Christ. But see, and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Turn to the person on the other side and say, by his grace, I will be faithful. By his grace, I will be faithful. Over today and tomorrow, by God's will, what we want to do is we want to see what it means to be a saint and what it means to be faithful. All right, that's our charge. To understand what we have received from the Lord Jesus Christ and the blessings that he's blessed us with. And because of those blessings, there is a response that's expected of us and we want to give that response. Okay, so by his grace, we'll be faithful. Uh, grace unto you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. What I w want you to do with your permission is to paraphrase it just so that I can move some words here and there so you can get the pattern, all right? Verse 3, before that, blessed, is the God, blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who has blessed us and see God's plenty. In Him, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Verse 4, God's preference. In Him, God chose the foundation of the world. Verse 4 again, God's presence. In Him, that we should be holy and blameless before God. Verse 5, God's predestination. In Him, God predestined us in love for adoption as sons according to the purpose of God's will. Verse 6, God's praise. In Him, God the Father has blessed us to the praise of God's glorious Son. Verse 7, God's pardon. In Him, we have redemption through Christ's blood, the forgiveness of our offenses. Verse 8, God's profusion or abundance. In Him, according to the riches of God's grace, God lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight. Verse 9, God's purpose that in Him, making known to us the mystery of God's will, according to God's purpose. Verse 10, God's plan. In Him to unite all things, things in heaven and things on the earth as a plan for the full 
Verse 11, God's possession. In him, we have been claimed as God's own possession, having been predestined according to the purpose of God, who works all things according to the counsel of God's will. Verse 12, God's priority. In him, we who were the first to hope in Christ might be to the praise of his glory. Verse 13 and 14, we see God's promise. In him, you also, when you heard of God's truth, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation and believed in him was sealed with the promised Holy Spirit who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory. May God richly bless the reading of his word to our hearts. And I know this is a rich passage, but let me just pray with you before you sit down. All right, Father, we thank you for your word. This is your inspired word. We are unable, Lord, to fathom it without your spirit. And so we pray that my frailty, my weakness, my inability, Lord, would not come in your way to speak to these precious souls, the ones that you have great plans to use and to multiply the labor of their hands. So we thank you for your presence here. May your spirit, Lord, move in the midst uh, and fill them, Lord, to to the potential that you've called them. Thank you. In Jesus Christ, Lord's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. All right. So, like I said, what we want to do with the next two days is to look at this. Our learning is going to be this. What does it mean to be a saint? And how are we going to be faithful? All right. And uh, so let's look at the Context, And I want to just create the context, but I want you to get the excitement of the context. I'm not sure if he caught this, but Paul doesn't take a breath from verse 3 to verse 14. It's just one single sentence. He's so excited that he doesn't take a breath lest he lose your interest. And so he packs it a lot, packs in a lot, all right? And, uh, and so the... Uh, the illustration that comes to my mind is I'm not sure how many of you have gone uh, to Niagara Falls. Have you, how many of you have seen the Niagara Falls? Right. Have you been on the Maid of the Mist and what used to be called the Maid of the Mist? Right. You take the boat and you go down. Uh, those of you who have been very unlucky not to see it, uh, you take this boat, you, you get down, you come to the, almost to the bottom of where the water falls. It's 600,000 gallons of water per second just streaming down. It's one probably among the greatest sights you can see. They say it's one of the seven wonders, uh, natural wonders of the world. But I want to tell you what Paul is trying to say is that this is like the divine Niagara. This is like, this is out of the world. He's so excited. He's just excited and trying to tell you what we have in Jesus Christ. But not just that. I want you to notice the emphasis of this passage. The phrase in him appears again and again and again in him. I want you to understand that what we have is only because of him, because of Jesus Christ. And we all know that. But I want us to be reminded of that. Um, I grew up in Hyderabad in India. And there, just outskirts of this uh, city, is this Golconda Fort. Anybody been there to Hyderabad? I'm not sure, but um, right. And, and so this place, this, this fort is built on a hill. They've got some great architectural marvels. You know, I mean, there's water that can go from the bottom of the hill to the top of the hill. But something else that caught my attention is at the bottom of the hill, there is this slab of a stone. You can stand on that. When you clap your hand, this clap can be heard at the top of the hill. And the unique part about this is the moment you step away from that, you don't stand on the slab. You move away from that, you clap, it doesn't go anywhere. It's like that public, the Pharisee who prayed a prayer unto himself. Right? I'm not sure if you caught that, but um, you know, the point is that slab we can move away from. We cannot move away from. It's in him that we have all this, in him. Paul is talking to us about that, right? And I also want you to look at the extent of what we have received in the Lord Jesus Christ. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. 
I'm not sure if you're a visual person, but this is what I think. You know, I just like go and go to this heavenly store and says like, can I can I have that blessing? And and the and the person at the store says like, no, that's gone. Like, can I have that? No, that's gone. Like, where is it gone? Oh, the Lord came and took it all away for the saints. He every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Now, I want you to understand that. You know, let that sink in. I, um, I, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he says it's in him, we can take our confidence. We know what he's telling is true. He's not like a used car salesperson, is he? You know, when he sells you a car and he says it's rust free, and then you go home and you find it's full of rust. And you go back and then uh, you talk to him and you say, what happened? You, I thought you said it's rust free. And he says, yeah, it is rust free. You don't have to pay for it. <laughs> like, am I not communicating a lot? <laughs> but I'm not sure how many of you bought a car recently. You know, you go into this car uh, showroom and you find this fancy car. And you look at what you find and you say, wow, this is great and I'm going to sign up. And then you finally sign up. But the card that you get is not the one in the showroom. It's something out there in the lot which has got many, many things missing. But what God is saying is he's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. I, I, I want you to start feeling that. I want you to know that this is real if you're in Jesus Christ. If you're a saint in Jesus Christ, this is real. All right? And um, what I want to do is, as we look here, I want to get us to the three parts of this passage. And I want to elaborate very quickly to you what we have in the Trinity. God the Father... God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And I want you to know that unlike the car salesperson, there's no fine print, there's no reading between the lines, there's no divine legalese. What he says is what we get. And in fact, you know, uh, as you get to uh, Ephesians 3, it says that you can't even think what he has blessed us with. So when we look at the first one, uh, from verse 4 to 14, but the first part of the passage is from verse 4 to 6. We see that God has chosen us in the eternity past. He chose us before the foundation of the world were laid. Before the foundation of the fo- world was laid, the Father chose us. And that was eternity, eternity past. But look at what the God, the Son, has done. We read from verses 7 to 12 that he has redeemed us in the historical past. And where, where did he do that? Where did the Lord Jesus Christ redeem us? What did he do? What did he do? Should I start speaking Chinese? Or? What did he do for us on the cross? Did he redeem you? On the cross, he redeemed us. All right, okay. And the spirit, he sealed us in our personal past. Uh, Right? When we we come to uh, trust him, when we come to put our faith in him, he does that. Right? I want to read to you a quote by Warren Wearsby. This is what it says. As far as God the Father is concerned, you were saved when you were chosen in Christ in eternity past, but that alone did not save you. For as far as God the Son is concerned, you were saved when he died for you on the cross. And as far as God the Spirit is concerned, you were saved when you yielded to his conviction and received Christ as your Savior the Trinity involved in our salvation. Trinity involved in making us saints unto him in the creation, in the cross, in the conversion. In the creation, the Father, and the cross, the uh, Son, and in the conversion, the Holy Spirit. And yet we see the Trinity in all of that. And I want to go through each of that little in detail so that you know what that means, all right? So let's look at the first section. And in the Father, we have received, what I want to say is we have received an identity. 
we have received an identity. Verse 4, we were chosen to be holy and blameless. And verse 5, we were predestined to be adopted as sons. Holy and blameless sons and daughters before God. What, what does identity mean? What do you think? What does identity mean? Anybody wants to take a stab at it? No? Identity? You know, we sometimes sit on it, right? And it says, show me your ID, and then you take out your driver's license or whatever it is, or you show the certificate on the wall. We, we, we tend to define ourselves by something or someone. What defines us is an identity. And the father is saying, listen, I want to give you an identity like no one else. There's no ID theft in this. No one can steal what God has given you in the father. The father has given you in the son. I, um, I'm not sure if he's here, but I was talking to a friend of mine and I uh, mispronounced his son's name. And he corrected me immediately. He's a seven-year-old. And he corrected me immediately. And I was thinking, really, you know, our name is an identity. We try our best to hold on to our name, to make a name for ourselves, do we not? We, we want an identity. And yet, the greatest identity that we can ever have is what God gives us in his son that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to the adoption of sons. I ask myself this, like, what, what makes your identity? What's the identity that you're striving for? You want a job, and so then that becomes your identity? Or you've got a profession, and that becomes your identity? Or you want to get married and... You know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what frames your identity. Or sometimes we want to make our own identity, isn't it? How does that poem Invictus go? Have you heard of the poem Invictus? No? Uh, I want to be a master of my own fate and the captain of my own soul. Should I start speaking Malayalam? <laughs> You've seen the uh, movie Frozen, all right? Okay, now I get some laughter, so, all right, that's good. But you know what's happening in Frozen? Elsa is singing that song, Let It Go, <laughs> all right? What she's singing is that I don't want to be defined by anyone else. I'm going to make my own identity. That perfect girl is gone, or whatever those uh, words are. But God is saying, you see, our greatest need is identity. Our greatest need is identity. And I want to tell you, my brothers, my sisters, you would not find a greater identity than what the God of the universe can give you. To be called his son and to be called his daughter. And that you would be holy and blameless before him. That, you know, we look at ourselves, look at me, and you would say, oh, wow, this guy is up there in the stage. He's talking about all this. I know him. Yeah, those stories are true. But, you know, something is the father looks at me through the son. He sees me as holy and blameless because I stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. That is my identity. That can be your identity if it is not. And if that is your identity if you are a saint in Christ Jesus. Identity. He gives you. All right? But um, I also want us to look at what the Son gives us. Verses 7 to 12. Verse 7 says, We have redemption through His blood. The riches of His grace which He lavished upon us. The riches of His grace... I, I don't know if you understand. Did, is there anybody here who deserved grace? Anybody? Just raise your hand. I know there are some people here who deserve grace. I know. I know. This, you guys are good guys. Anybody here who, who deserve grace? What? No. Nobody? But you know what he does? Not just grace. He's giving us the riches of his grace. 
And that's the quality, the riches, you know, the best if there is in God's estimation. He gives us the very best. That's the quality. And not just that. What does he do? He lavishes it upon us. The quantity is just like, you know, it's like the Indian hospitality. You never get your plate empty. There's a story that, that, that I remember reading some time ago. It's about this uh, people in, a, in that boat, and they had run out of water. And because they ran out of water, they, they, would, they would die very soon, but there's water all over the place. And out of desperation, at one point, they, they just let down a pail to get this water. And as they drink that water, they realize that it's fresh water. And they realize only much later that though they are miles away from the Amazon, the gush, the amount of water that pours into the, I think it pours into the Pacific or the Atlantic, I don't know where it goes, but one of the oceans, as it pours into it, the seawater is pushed miles away because of this amount of water that's coming in. And I want you to understand, you are right there. This redemption, this riches of grace in Christ's glory, the, the lavishing of the riches of grace, it can cleanse away every spot, every stain. Nothing, nothing can stand in, in, in the presence of this divine tsunami. And as I was writing this, I asked myself this. I'm not sure... I don't know most of you. I don't know. I don't know what you're struggling with. I don't know if, as the psalmist said, you've made your bed in Sheol. You know, and Psalm 139 says, I made my bed in hell. Because you feel that you are so weighed down that even God cannot redeem you. I'm not sure if it's because you're addicted to porn or substance abuse or I, I, I don't know what it be, what it might be. But what's worse is that if you're cruising along thinking that everything is okay, you haven't done anything wrong, you, you, know, you don't have any of these obvious sins that people talk about and you're that good old Sunday school kid, everything's all right, then you're even in a worse situation, without Christ, without this, this Niagara of God's riches, we are messed up. But in Him, in Him, we have an inheritance because as you come to verse 8, it says, riches of His grace has been lavished upon us with all wisdom and insight. You know, what, if... I was uh, thinking, I don't know if you have any of the translations, but I know if Paul were writing here in 2016, he would, have, he would have written probably, God did not go, oops. It means that he blessed you and then didn't think, oh, he's the one I gave it to, she's the one I gave it to. No, he didn't do that. That's not what he, he lavished it with all the wisdom and insight. It's a thought through plan. So if the devil is telling you that you're beyond God's redemption, I want you to look at the son who with his riches of grace, which is lavished upon you. And that's what we have in the son because it says there, that Schaefer says it this way. He says, um, there are 33 riches of divine grace that has become ours in Christ Jesus. So many things God has given us. You know, I, I love that phrase, uh, the, the paragraph of that song, Jesus paid it all. It says, when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt with him, Upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. I want you to believe what God is telling you today and not what the devil has been prompting in your ear. Because when he redeems you, he redeems you completely, makes you holy and blameless to be adopted in him as sons and daughters of the king. 
And so we read in verse 11 that in the Son, we have him as our inheritance, as an inheritance. We have him as an inheritance. And, and we heard it this morning when Ben said that each of this, you know, what the Father did, what the Son did, what the Spirit did, all of that is to the praise of his glory, to the praise of his glory. I would say, you know, if the angels were to look at me and see how I've been transformed, that will definitely be to the praise of his glory. So that guy, yeah, of course, only God can do what he's done. And I'm not sure if you would say that of yourselves or you know, you, or you think that it's easy for God to work in, on you. You're better than me. It could be. But I want you to know that God offers his son as an inheritance to us. I, um, I had this friend of mine who some years ago, his daughter was only four years old and asked him, Dad, Dada, why does Jesus love us? I'm going to ask you that. If, if a child is going to ask you, why did Jesus love you, or love her, or love him, what would your answer be? Do you, do you have a theological answer? Do you have a response? Do you, can you say, yeah, we were sinners and he loved us? So this friend of mine, he started to have this conversation. He wanted to tell her, his four-year daughter why Jesus loved him. And he says to me later, he says at one point he had to stop. And he realized that he didn't have an answer as to why Jesus would love him. We have no answer. Why would the king of the universe love us? I... I was with some Thai friends, and I think you may have seen The King and I. I'm not sure if you watched that movie, but The King and I. But one thing there, if it caught your attention, is that the common eye cannot see or was not allowed to see the king. And as soon as the king would walk in, there would be this proclamation that would be made, and they had to bend down with their eyes probably close, but to the floor. They could not even look up and see the king. And yet the king of the universe, the, your savior, your redeemer, was naked on the cross. And eyes would see him and mock him. And wag their heads at him. Why would he want to go through such humiliation when you and I could not contribute anything to the equation. And so I want you to know there's nothing that you can do, good or bad, that keeps you away from this spiritual blessing. Every spiritual blessing in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus. Ben was making this reference again about how God came seeking Adam and Eve, right? Adam, where are you? God was not asking for a geographical location. God did not want, God is not playing hide and seek and say, hey, Adam, where are you? No. He comes seeking. I want to read to you a verse from Isaiah. Isaiah 65, verse 1. Isaiah 65, verse 1. This is what it says. I was ready to be sought. This is the God of gods, the King of kings, who's saying this. I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name. God is saying, here I am. I'll read to you another quote by Rachel Held Evans. He says, the whole story of Advent is a story of how God cannot be kept out. God is present. God is with us. God shows up, not with a parade, but, the, but with a whimper of a baby, not among the powerful, but among the marginalized, not to the demanding, but to the humble. God comes seeking. 
God comes seeking. And so we see that in the Father, we have the identity. In the Son, we have the inheritance. When you get to the Holy Spirit, which is from verse 13 and, uh, verse 13 and 14, we see that we have the insurance in the Spirit. Insurance in the Spirit. Verse 13, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit. Seal is a mark of ownership. They put the seal in, they know who the person belongs to or the thing belongs to you, or the cattle belongs to you. That's the seal, or even a document. A seal is a spirit. And then you have spirit as a guarantee. Verse 14, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory? He is like given to us as a security deposit. The Holy Spirit is given to us as a security deposit. If you are a saint, you have the Holy Spirit given to you, and God has paid 100% as a security deposit. And that's earnest money. What that means is, if God fails to keep his promise, you get to keep the earnest money. And so God paints himself into a corner. He, he you know, we win either ways. Just hypothetically, if you think that God is, is not going to keep his promise, you get to keep God. If he keeps his promise, we get to keep God. For eternity. I, I wanted to walk, walk you through this just to let you know that many times we have read Ephesians, but there's so much that we have in Jesus Christ. But I also want to tell you that it's all in him. If you're not in him, there's nothing for you. It's either in him or not in him. I'm not sure how many of you have sung that Sunday school song, one door and only one, and yet it cites a two. You guys didn't go to Sunday school? Or, or this is like an outdated old one, or I'm not dating myself. Anybody here who's, who knows about that song? Very few. All right, thank you. I was just feeling so left out. <laughs> one door and only one, and yet it cites a two, inside and outside, on which side are you? I want to tell you, dear brothers and sisters, this is not fancy. This is not, you know, this is not anything that, you know, is mythical or, or something that's beyond your reach. Or you'd say, wait, I, I, just got, I just got to enjoy my life a bit before I get into being a Christian with, with such a long jaw that I can trip on it. But I want to tell you, your greatest joy, it can only be in Jesus Christ, in Him, because the Father is giving you an identity like no other. This world, this, the, it, it promises you a lot of things, but never gets, gets you anything. In Him. In Him. That's the only reason that makes me want to get up in the morning, because I see how much I have received, and that there are so many out here in the world, out here, I don't know how many of you are just still toying with this idea of who Jesus needs to be in their lives. And I beg you, I beg you, don't delay anymore. He's worth everything. God has given it all because he's all in. All the chips are on the table. He's kept nothing back. As a song we sing sometimes, he emptied the heavens. The darling of heaven crucified. There is um, there's a story said about Arnold Palmer who was an old-time golfer. 
he had gone to Saudi Arabia and he must have played good golf because the king said, I want to give you a gift. And Arnold Palmer refused. And he says, you know, he was very modest. And he says, no, thank you. It's all right. I, you know, don't want to receive a gift. But in that part of the world, uh, denying, saying no to a gift, when, when, especially when the king is giving you, is supposed to be a slur, an insult. And so Arnold Palmer then said, all right, just give me a, you know, a golf cl- club. And the next day, he gets this document, a deed for a golf club with 36 uh, holes and a restaurant and everything. He was thinking he would just get a club, but he got the clubhouse. You see, what it is, is before the king, you never ask for a a small thing. And you learn this lesson that before the king, the divine king, the king of kings, the Lord of lords, when you come to him and ask him of anything he gives according to his riches, which he lavishes upon you. And when you deny his gift, where would he go? Where would he go? Who else can you go to? I have some statistics here. It says that on a crowd like this, 30% of our 30% of us are addicted to pornography. One in ten are addicted to video gaming. 9.4% of teenagers from 12 years and over have used some form of illegal drugs. 60% of you have had some form of sexual experience. But I pray to God that these results are skewed in our group that it's not true in our group. And yet, because of our fallenness, we are not without sin. And what I'd like us to do is, I want you to, I want you to understand this. I want you to know, be reminded, that it's only in Jesus Christ. And no wonder Paul was so excited to tell you about him, about what you have in him. I, I don't want you to be a mere statistic. I, 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 want, I don't want you to squander this riches that God so richly lavishes on us. And so I ask this question, what's your decision? What's your decision? Are you okay to live life just on the edge You got saved, you've said the sinner's prayer, and so you think everything is okay, you can have your legs in both the boats. And I fear that you might be knocking on the wrong side of the door saying, God, let me in, let me in. And he would just say, I never knew you. Now I pray that doesn't happen to anybody here. Don't fall for the, for the, you know, the advertising of this world. Know that what God offers you is the very best and out of the world. So I'm going to ask you to stand up again as I, as I want you to take some time to pray and to commit, but I'm going to, if I can have you stand up and And if I can uh, also ask the music team to just come up. Not sure if they're on here, but if they can come up and sing for us or lead us in that Jesus paid it all. Um, I want to, before they start singing, I want you to think, just take some time, an honest evaluation of where you are in your life. And I, I know I put this challenge, I have no idea where you are, but God knows where you are. 
how far you've strayed or how close you are and whether you, you know, what you are struggling with. But I want you to know that this God of universe, he keeps his promise. He makes an oath on top of it. His character and his covenant will both ensure that what he says will come true. And so take some time as you think about what it means to you. Tell him you love him. Tell him, let him know that you're so thankful that he would send his son to come down and to die that ignominious, you know, the shameful death on the cross. I'm not sure if there's anybody here who still doesn't know what it means to know this precious Savior. I want you to come and ask us, talk to us. It's not in the sinner's prayer that saves you, but your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. As you put your faith in Him, realizing that we have messed up, we cannot be the masters of our of our, um, of our fate and the captains of our soul, that he alone can be the captain of our life. It's to Jesus we want to turn.
Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. Even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace with which he blessed us in the beloved in him we have redemption through his blood the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose which is set forth in Christ as a fullness of time to unite all things in him that in one line is what God is all about to unite all things in Jesus Christ and that you and I would be as sons and daughters of the Father. Father God, we want to thank you for your Son. We thank you, Lord. We thank you. We can never fully thank you, Lord, for all that you mean to us and all that you are. And this evening, Lord, I I beg you for the souls of these dear brothers and sisters. I pray, Lord, that wherever they be in their station of life, whatever their struggles be, whatever the world has been telling them, the lie that they've fallen for or they're listening to, the, the repetition of the messages that they keep getting in schools, universities, at workplace. We pray, Father, that your word would richly dwell in their hearts, would bear much fruit. And Lord, the, that you, the plans that you have for them would abound to your praise and your glory. And thank you for all the heads that are about. We thank you for answering our prayers because we offer this in your name and for your glory. Amen. Amen. Please be seated.